become clear, hasn't it, to millions of people that one of the biggest and most urgent issues we face is global warming. I mean, worries about climate catastrophe have inspired the new movements, you know, like school student strikes, Extinction Rebellion, the movements that have exploded really this year. Now, I don't know if you saw, but earlier this year, there was a um, Lancet Medical Journal published something called the Planetary Health Diet. And this had been created by a whole number of scientists. And they set some universal scientific targets for healthy diets. And they said that if these were adopted, not only would it save at least 11 million people a year from deaths due to unhealthy food, but it would also help avert global environmental catastrophe, catastrophe and prevent the collapse of the natural world. And their whole message was, the world's diets must change dramatically to save the planet and save ourselves. So they recommended this scientific diet, largely plant-based, most proteins come from pulses and nuts, and they said consumption of red meat and sugar needs to half across the globe. Now I think it's absolutely right to look at um, the impact of what we eat, both on ourselves and on the environment. Actually, the figures they came used was there's 800 million people going hungry, there's 2 billion people undernourished, another 2 billion people <coughs> overweight or obese, and they said that unhealthy diets are actually the leading cause of ill health worldwide. They said that actually that unhealthy diets are a greater risk to morbidity and mortality than unsafe sex, alcohol, drug and tobacco use combined. And I think it is also right to look at global food production and farming in terms of their impact on climate change and the destruction of wildlife and pollution of rivers and oceans. And the conclusion of this report was that a radical transformation of the global food system is urgently needed. I would agree with that. The problem was there was very little in this report about how that transformation might be achieved. In fact, the whole implication of it, and definitely how it was taken up and portrayed in the media, was that the onus is on us, the consumer, to change our eating habits. Lots of people used to say we must all give up meat and go vegan. Lots of professors were questioning whether people would change their diets. But overall, it was this impression that if we could be persuaded to change what we eat, all is going to be okay. We'll be healthy, the environment's going to be saved. I think that this approach gets it the wrong way round. You know, and rather than starting with the individual consumer, what we actually need to do is look at how food is produced under capitalism and the rise of industrialised agriculture. Because it seems like a personal choice, you know, what you put in your mouth. But the choice of what we eat doesn't take place in a vacuum, does it? It's shaped by a wider society. And what people eat or don't eat has always been determined by this complex interplay of social, economic and technological forces. You know, it's part and parcel of the society we actually live in. And that means you can't abstract food from capitalism. Food is a commodity to be bought and sold. The growing, the making of it, the processing and selling of food is very big business. Bottom line is profit, you know, regardless of the impact on health, the environment, workers or animals. And actually, this much derided so-called Western diet, uh, a diet that's really high in saturated fat and salt, red meat, refined grains and processed food, is a consequence of this system rather than a response to consumer choice. And actually, industrialised agriculture under capitalism is dominated by big business and multinationals. That's what's destroying our health and destroying the planet. The problem is they want to roll this out even further. And this is really what I want to explore in this meeting. But just before we go any further, I do think we have to just say a few words um, about global warming because changing our diet alone is not going to stop this. The 2014 IPCC report found that total global emissions from agriculture, forestry and land use are about 24% of the world's total. So even radical transformation to our diet would leave three quarters of emissions untouched. And I think we should be clear from the start here, the real problem about global warming is the fossil fuel industry. You know, people might have seen the report in 2017, it found that just 100 companies are responsible for 71% of global emissions since 1988. So really it's a very small number of uh, corporations, and mostly fossil fuel corporations, responsible for the vast majority of emissions. And the real solution to climate change is to stop burning fossil fuels, you know, the coal and oil and gas, make a rapid switch to renewables, and increase energy efficiency. And I think so to seriously tackle global warming, we can't rely on just changing our diets. <coughs> and that also, when it comes to perhaps putting the argument of uh, you know, different areas of food we have to give up or not eat, I think as well you can't abstract one aspect of food production from the rest of capitalist agriculture. Actually, just because something 
is vegan or even organic, it doesn't mean it's been produced sustainably. The thing is, you see, modern agriculture as a whole is enormously destructive to the environment. And really, for three, uh, it contributes massively to climate change. You know, it is still contributing to a quarter of the emissions for three main reasons. Partly because an increasing part of agriculture is being used to grow crops to produce feed for animals and actually biofuels as well, which I'll probably come back to. But you know, livestock farming itself, and cattle in particular, are some of the biggest um, emissions of, uh, of agriculture. Also, agriculture is a very big cause of deforestation. I, mean, I think it's something like 71% of tra tropical deforestation between 2000 and 2012 was linked to clearances for cultivation, i.e. for farming. And the whole of modern industrialised agriculture is reliant on the use of fossil fuels, from the fertilisers to the pesticides to the plastic packaging to transportation. It's not only climate change, though, that industrial agriculture contributes to. It actually causes a much wider array and environmental problems. I mean, some studies estimate it's destroyed up to 75% of the world's agrobiodiversity and uses up to 80% of the planet's fresh water. So I think it is worth looking at agriculture and capitalism in some more detail. It's characterised by monocultures, meaning that rather than having a wide variety of crops being grown in an area and rotated, perhaps each year, or grown together, one crop is repeatedly grown, usually in vast quantities. Now, this is a problem because one of the biggest issues facing agriculture is the soil being stripped of its nutrients. And different crops being grown actually help replenish the soil and give back nutrients, as does setting aside land and not always using it every year. It's also characterised, um, capitalist agriculture, by the use of hybrid seeds and now genetically modified seeds. Now, traditionally, seeds are what you call open pollinated. And it would mean actually that farmers each year would select the best seeds you know, for the best crop to re replant. Um, hybrid seeds are a cross breeds. Um, they can create a stronger offspring, but you can't actually replant them. Um, they, they lose it, their vigour if they're replanted. They don't sort of breed true after one year of being grown. So obviously it's very good for seed companies because farmers now have to buy these new seeds every year. But it also leads to very heavy use of synthetic fertiliser and pesticide, which are byproducts <coughs> of the oil industry, because the hybrid seeds are bred to respond to fertiliser. As we know, pesticide use wipes out everything, including you know, things you might need in agriculture. It leads to species extinction, it's had a big impact on biodiversity. People have heard about monarch butterflies, the habitat, milkweed being disappearing due to all the weed killer um, killing everything. And really, you end up on what you might call the agricultural treadmill, where you start with these hybrid seeds and the chemical pesticides, and you think, oh well, you know, the farmer might think higher yield, lower costs. Actually, their ongoing use increased costs. The pests become chemical resistant. <coughs> Fertilisers deplete the soil even more of its vital nutrients. Secondary pest outbreaks happen because things that were pests become pests because the natural enemies <laughs> that used to get eat them are being destroyed by pesticide. And changes to soil qualities from overuse of fertilisers leave the crops even more vulnerable to disease and damage. You get super bugs and super weeds um, developing really in response to this use of chemicals. Farmers are buying even more inputs then. And this, this continues, and we'll come back to that probably in a bit, but another feature of industrialised agriculture as well is the rearing of animals in giant warehouses or feedlots no longer on the land. It's only been made possible really through massive antibiotic use, which is actually impacting the health of our resistance. And outbreaks <coughs> such as swine flu, very prevalent in these conditions, it's created a massive problem as well of waste animal manure. And really, if we want to see this vision of agriculture and capitalism and the problems, one place to look is Iowa, which is in the American Midwest, which is at the heart of the US Corn Belt. We will experiment with PowerPoint. You might have seen this is experimental today for me. Um, but here we are. Here's Iowa. And um, here we have a bit of a scene from Iowa. Uh, the landscape is vast. Uh, vast areas, growing corn and now soya. Pretty much actually not a lot of farmers. They've all, you know, family farms have been wiped out. Nearly 100% of the corn and soy being grown there is genetically modified, led to a massive rise in herbicide use, specifically Monsanto's Roundup. Um, you know, GM crops are engineered to survive its spraying. They're marketed as being Roundup ready seeds, you know, ready for the spraying. Let's just note here, I think I might have a, a picture. There's some more of Iowa. Here we have Roundup being sprayed. Um, some toxic photos maybe here. Yeah. Um, but actually, um, they just had to pay $2 billion worth of damages um, to a couple because it's actually been found and proved to cause 
uh, uh, cancer. Um, but all the um, corn and soy that's grown in Iowa, it's not all used to feed people. Lots of it goes to used to feed pigs now. There's something like 8,000 pig farms in Iowa. At any one time, there's approximately 20 million pigs being raised there. It's more than the people. Um, and at the same time, another thing is they've got like 40 or more probably ethanol refineries which take the rest of the corn and turn it into biofuel. And all this has caused massive soil erosion. Iowa's lost something like 50% of its topsoil and 50% of its organic content in the soil. And the increased animal manure from all the pigs, but also all the fertiliser and all of its over applied to the fields, has created massive runoff into the rivers, caused massive pollution. Um, actually, I think I've got another picture here. This is a pig farm, apparently. <laughs> this, is a, this is the lake of the manure that comes after, where it's like clumpsy swamps that they don't know what to do with it all. But actually, um, this is, uh, they've had to create the biggest water treatment plant in the world um, to try and protect their drinking water from all the nitrates and E. coli and potassium laden sediment that has flowed downstream from these fields in Iowa. But then the problem doesn't just stay in Iowa. All that fertiliser and manure runs off down the river, empties out miles away in the Gulf of Mexico. And that has led to something called the dead zone. That, oh, I think that's an oil ref uh, refinery there. This is, the de this is the picture of a dead zone, actually. Um, because what this means is, and they say now, this year, this dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico has been 8,000 square miles. All sea life is suffocated and dies. Nothing can live. So, how have we ended up in this situation? Where food production, you know, with something we depend, has such a devastating impact on the environment. It's worth reflecting on, because I think for a lot of us in Britain, food is something we buy. We're very disconnected, aren't we, from the growing of it. But at its most basic, the growing of crops is the conversion of nutrients from soil and carbon dioxide <coughs> in the atmosphere, converting that into plants, can be eaten either by us or by animals, turned into milk and meat. And farming began as people began to domesticate plants and animals some 10 to 12,000 years ago. It's part of what was called the Neolithic Revolution. And for thousands of years, people had a direct relationship with the land and the source of food. And since ancient times, you know, farmers did know that applying extra nutrients to soil can help improve your crop yields. Historically, animal manure was used. The problem was capitalism ripped up the historic ways of living and growing food. Think about in Britain, people forcibly separated from the land with the acts of enclosure, which, you know, fenced off the common areas that had been used, forced many of those people into the towns to work in the new textile mills and other <coughs> industries, had a very big environmental impact. It's something actually Marx and Engels, who were writing during the years of industrialization, did talk about. And just to be clear here, you see they make very clear that we're part of nature. You know, as Engels put it, we don't stand and rule above nature like a conqueror or stand outside nature. That actually we as humans, we belong to nature and exist in its midst. And so for Marxists, human society is inextricably linked to the natural world. We're dependent on it, but we also act back on it. Of course, humans have always had an impact on the environment. Before capitalism, people sometimes had a bad impact on it. The, the, scale, the, the thing is, the scale is completely different now under capitalism. And Marx and Engels also identified that that drive for profit means that capitalism relates to the natural world quite differently to previous societies. You know, the natural environment under capitalism is just something to either be exploited for profit or a rubbish dump for the system's unwanted products. You know, we chop down the forests. Um, we bury nuclear waste, we dump our plastic in the seas. And because it's like, so it's a short term, you know, the system's characterised by short termism. Every individual capitalist is thinking about short term profits rather than long term consequences. And because the drive of profit is completely, you know, it, it's unplanned and irrational, there's waste at every level. Um, you know, we think of packaging or production or food waste. And the external costs of the production to nature are not factored in. You know, whether it's carbon emissions or air pollution or waste plastic, you know, not factored in for that individual company or factory, their costs to be borne by nature and society. So their point was, in the long run, capitalism can only be seen as unsustainable society. But very crucially, Marx talked about something called metabolic rift. Because he was saying, as people were forced off the land and into the towns during the Industrial Revolution, it led to a situation where those <coughs> nutrients from the countryside, essentially in the form of food, were transported to the cities where workers were, but those nutrients were not returned to the countryside. Instead, they're just dumped 
in rivers and seas as waste. So it's in effect a one-way flow of nutrients from the countryside to the cities. And this has a very big impact on soil fertility. And uh, in the early days of capitalist agriculture, they tried to get over this problem of declining soil fertility by digging up graveyards and the Napoleonic and burial sites from the Napoleonic Wars and grinding up the bones and using that to be um, to use as fertilizer. And then they discovered something called guano, which is a nutrient-rich excrement of bats and seabirds, and this whole story of guano and <laughs> colonization actually. But this was helpful. And but what it meant was that you're getting farms now dependent on inputs that you have to buy. And again, this further pushes more peasants off the land and lead to, leads to larger scale farms dominating food production. And also, although guano and they also begin artificial fertilisers develops in the 19th century, have, have an impact of kind. They postpone the problem, if you like, of full infertility, but it doesn't solve the problem of meta metabolic rift. And it further, they further contaminate, actually, the rivers and aquifers and streams. And the exhaustion of soil, if you think about it, is one of the key drivers for the westward expansion of the US. And it was well something that led to the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, you know, when topsoil blew off the overfarmed lands. So really, the point I'm making here, there were problems with capitalist agriculture right from the start, because sometimes people just say it's now. But actually, right from the start, there is a problem here. Um, but the biggest changes to both agriculture and food come after the Second World War. Now, it's interesting. That report I quoted at the start uh, by The Lancet said we needed this great food transformation and claimed that humanity has never aimed to change the global food system on the scale envisaged. See, that's not quite true. There has already been a great food transformation. That's the problem. Because it might not have been something people set out to do as an aim, but what we eat has changed more in the years since the Second World War than probably the 40,000 years before it. And it's in these years since the, the war, big changes take place in agriculture, and it's when we see the rise of this so-called Western diet. And it's at this point where it begins to be, and this is still the case, overproduction of key grains, maize, wheat and soybean, which are actually at the heart of most processed food. And why did this happen? We see the US uh, actually came out of the war, the, uh, it experienced an agricultural boom during the war actually, merged at the forefront of agricultural markets. Um, it also invest, had invested, the US government invested um, billions of dollars into oil related industries such as petrochemical plants to help the war effort. And uh, after the war, it sold these off very cheaply to companies like Monsanto and DuPont. Um, but actually, these, some of these uh, facilities have made things like you know, nitrates for bombs or toxic chemicals for poison gas. They were refitted to produce the synthetic fertilizers and pesticides as a, as a byproduct of the oil industry. They'd also, the US government had also invested <coughs> in all the car and, well, actually, you know, car plants to make jeeps and tanks during the war. They were refitted to make tractors and combine harvesters. The banks had lots of money from recently printed war dollars. They were able to lend it to farmers to buy these chemicals and machinery. Petroleum was cheap. This helped also fuel the modernisation of agriculture. And more land is brought into production. Farms get bigger. Production soared. Food prices came down. Huge food surpluses were built up. Um, it's interesting. For a while, the government offloaded a lot of this food into Europe as food aid. And then US farmers <laughs> could no longer absorb all the fertilisers and pesticides and new machinery being produced in the US, those inputs began to be sold to Europe uh, as part of the US's Marshall Plan for European Reconstruction. Um, even when Europe really <laughs> didn't need any more of these food and inputs, they continued to overproduce food. Rather than cutting back production, um, actually use subsidies and price support and quotas to ensure a continuous oversupply. Partly because actually it lowered the price of grains for these powerful grain traders, and it meant these cheap surpluses could be used by companies like the US as food aid, essentially dumped into overseas markets as a way to get in to those markets. So the point I'm making really is that farmers in the US were encouraged to grow the essential ingredients of processed foods through direct payments and subsidies. For example, in the 1970s, they were really encouraged to grow corn. It led to explosion of production. Um, it was great for the makers of convenience foods. It helped fuel new product development, in particular, the invention of high fructose corn syrup, you might have heard of, which is in lots, it replaces lots of sugar things, it's in lots of processed foods. Um, and technological changes at the same time helped to make these things possible. Um, and this policy has continued. I mean, something like recent years, something like $500 billion in agricultural subsidies was going each year to produce corn, soya, and also meat and dairy as sort of cheap raw materials for these highly processed foods. 
Um, and it also led to the growth of these massive multinationals and it changed what it was profitable for them to grow and it changes in what we eat. So for example, it became, you know, it was very cheap to grow grain, so they started feeding that to cattle. Um, and so in the late 1950s, there was a really big drive in America to encourage more beef consumption. You know, people might think, oh, it's my own choice to eat more beef burgers. Actually, it was a massive advertising campaign to do this. Also, chickens didn't used to get fed on corn and soybean. They are now. It was very cheap to do that. And there's new mass production methods of rearing poultry in the US were so successful by the 1970s. They just had far more chicken than people typically ate. And, you know, the flock sizes had gone from something like 70 chickens in the flock before the war. I mean, <laughs> 30,000 strong or more, the flock sizes of chickens now. So there's a limit to really how many roast dinners people would eat each week. You know, it's a once a week thing. So that's why, with the assistance of food, science and marketing, they repackage chicken in a whole new array of products. You know, chicken nuggets, chicken strips, um, cat food, all sorts. You know, you just think of all the different uses of chicken now. And you can see how that process continues. I think I did some pictures. The popcorn chicken is one kind. Chicken nuggets there. So a constant, um, you know find new ways of making something that's been quite cheap to produce. And it's not just with meat products either. Uh, processed cereal, not something that people used to actually eat. But the, the giant food processors were able to use this US agricultural surplus of corn and wheat and turn it into a very profitable export. Uh, yeah, it's a very cheap commodity, but you can turn it into a much higher value goods. I mean, it's completely nutritionally debased. Any, anything that's good in it is being taken out. It's completely reliant on marketing and packaging. And even those in the industry admit, you know, if you took the salt out, you'd be better off eating cardboard for taste and probably nutrition as well. But the point is, this is what they do with these cheap ingredients at every level. And so what we see is this massive industrialisation of agriculture and food production leads to colossal companies with global reach as well. And the food industry is worth something like $6 trillion a year, concentrated by oligopolies as well. Now, I just want to point out here that these multinationals that dominate agriculture and capitalism, they don't do a lot of farming themselves. It's better to call them agribusiness, really. They make money from the business of farming. So you've got the agrochemical and seed <coughs> companies, you know, Monsanto, it's actually been bought by Bayer now, Dow DuPont, they sell the inputs to farmers, they sell the seeds and the fertiliser and the pesticides. Or then you have the grain traders that store the grain and ship it um, between and within countries. People might have heard of cargo, I'll come back to that in a moment. Or you have the giant processing companies that make the money by turning these raw materials, like the grain and the soil and the sugar, into foods. You know, the yoghurt companies, the breakfast cereal companies. And then at the top end you have how they sell it to us through the fast food companies, McDonald's, KFC, and supermarkets. Um, like I said, they're characterised by mergers and all sorts. I mean, they're very, very um, big. I think it's something like just four agrochemical um, and seed firms control over 60% of global seed sales. So just four of them control that. Four giant firms control global agricultural flows. You know, they have their silos and ports and ships to do that. And I mentioned Cargill. People probably heard of Cargill now, become a bit more of a household name. Quite a secretive company, but massive. In 2015, their sales were $120 billion. Um, they employ something like 150,000 people in 70 countries, trading everything from cotton to animal feeds, meat, cocoa, and salt. So they produce all of the essentials for processed foods. They have actually 500 ships of their own to ship it about. <coughs> One of the biggest meat process, processors, in their words, they harvest more than 8 million cattle a year. But also, all of the eggs used in McDonald's in the US go through Cargill. That's 2 billion eggs a year, 2% of the total in the US. But the point here is these companies didn't just get big through their own efforts. They were helped by the US government and its agricultural policy by subsidizing corn and other crops. Really, it meant they could get them at prices below the cost of production. And it was Cargill you know, companies that then try and capture the market of other countries, like particularly in the developing world. And again, that helped by you know, US government uh, representatives and negotiators at institutions like the World Trade Organization, the World Bank and the IMF, <coughs> forcing these countries to open the markets to agricultural exports. And once they do so, cargo can go in, outcompete the local farmers, the subsidies they get means no one can compete. This brings us to where we are today. And not only are food processors constantly looking for new ways to sell us food, and a lot of people feel very strongly about this, and people might want to talk about this more in the discussion. Um, it is a part of what capitalism does to the food we eat with all the processing. 
but also these agricultural giants are constantly looking to expand into new countries. Uh, they want to make even more money from selling the seeds and inputs to farmers and changing what is grown to essentially these base ingredients for processed food. That's what's having a very big impact on the environment and our diet. So exporting, if you like, the model of industrialised agriculture and the subsequent Western diet. And that was actually what was behind the so-called Green Revolution of the 1960s and 70s. It was really about exporting this US industrial model to the global south. It involved the spread of hybrid seed, which displaced thousands of local varieties of wheat and maize and rice, led to a 90% reduction in in-situ agrobiodiversity. And of course, these were hybrid seeds reliant on fertiliser, pesticides, so industrial agriculture actually starts polluting the land and leading to more uh, greenhouse gases as well. And, uh, you know, as well, the whole process means that then farms are reliant on inputs, like the pesticides and fertilisers and the seeds, pushed out small holders. Large farms um, were encouraged to borrow, borrow very heavily, particularly from you know, the US and the UK banks, uh, to pay for these inputs. When they couldn't pay it back, that's when the IMF and the, and the World Bank stepped in. People might have heard of the structural adjustment programmes of the 1980s and 1990s, which it forced people, these countries, to dismantle their own grain reserves, stop growing their own food, and grow non-traditional export products because they could get dollars on the world market to pay back the banks. Since then, there's been things like the free trade agreements, which, again, they protect the markets and subsidies of the US and Europe, lower tariffs in the global south, and allow this dumping that we talk about, the selling of these subsidised <coughs> grains from the north but below the cost of production. Actually, this is what's made the global south dependent on, north, on, on food from the global north. The global south went from exporting food worth about a billion dollars in the 1970s to having to import 11 billion dollars worth of food by 2001. And of course then you get the whole thing where they become dependent on the north as a result of these policies. It confirms this whole notion somehow that these poor countries need to be developed and that means they have to have more industrialised agriculture. And there's going to be a new film out, I mean, just saying the consequences, called Toxification. I just saw it just before I came to the meeting here. Where it really talks about the impact on places like Punjab in India, which has used the most amount of pesticides. It, really toxic chemicals that are outlawed in lots of places. And how this has led to massive debt, but also drug addiction and suicide. And partly drug addictions, because they haven't really helped uh, increase yields. And actually, part of the drugs people take are, are an opium husk, which allows them to you know, suppress his appetite and allows them to work harder. So you just see this massive impact of, of destroying not only agriculture and people's lives. But despite this expansion that I'm going through, uh, that I've talked about, there's still a lot of scope for agribusiness to expand further. And um, what's quite interesting is that there has been a displacement of the peasantry, but actually the world today has about as many small-scale peasant farmers as it did over 100 years ago. In fact, what I found very interesting is only 30% of the world's food is, pro is produced by these huge, highly capitalised industrial agribusiness operations that I've been describing. More than 70% of the world's food is produced by small family farms, and we do it on less than 25% of the world's arable land. That's what agribusiness wants to get into, isn't it? Now again, I think it's worth pausing here, because one of their justifications for this is, well, we can help feed the world. You know, these are poor, backward peasants. They need the help, expertise and technology of us big agricultural giants. This is such a colonial view of the world, isn't it? You know, in fact, peasant farmers have great agricultural knowledge, built up over generations, knowledge of their own soil, their climate, their prolific experimenters of different seeds. And as I say, actually, peasants and smallholders actually do still feed most of the world. One of the problems of the Green Revolution was not just that it affected land and poisoned it in the way that I'm talking about, but it also affected peasant seeds. I mentioned earlier, about open pollinated varieties of seeds that farmers could keep back the best each year, use, the use it for the next harvest, <coughs> often experimenting over decades to get the best seed that fitted their <coughs> land and climate. And actually, modern crop varieties are bred from gene banks from these native seeds. What the Green Revolution did was really allow the Monsantos of this world to privatise all that genetic material developed by the peasantry over millennia. You know, this material was just free for these... Um, seed industry, but then they develop these hybrid seeds that don't breed after one year in the same way, and then farmers were obliged to buy the new seeds every year. And often they weren't as good, actually, as, as the previous seeds, you know, that had been selected over millennia to work in a certain environment, 
And you know, places like Malawi, Monsanto had taken over the uh, National Seed Company. Um, and actually, Monsanto's direct, uh, former country director co authored Malawi's national seed policy, which actually threatened to outlaw the practice of farmers saving, exchanging, and selling their seeds. So I've just realised I'm getting near my time. But um, there is a really uh, interesting story of Mexico and maize. Because actually, maize is one of the world's most important food crops. Mexico is what is called a centre of origin for the crop. The ancient Mayan civilization domesticated maize 9,000 years ago. There's something like 22,000 different varieties in Mexico. So that's what we're used to seeing. But look at this. This is like the sort of different types and varieties of corn in, um, in Mexico. This looks uh, amazing. Obviously, the big um, agrochemical companies like Monsanto really had their sights set on it, though, to grow GM corn. Uh, one Mexican farmer said, if you can do it in Mexico, where corn originated, you can do anything. It's like planting a flag on the moon. And obviously, people were very worried about you know, um, GM corn threatening the genetic integrity of, of the crops, really. And this would be a problem for the future as well. There's a very big battle, uh, an injunction placed to stop this. But contamination has happened of their, their corn. Um, also though, what was really a big problem was the NAFTA free trade policy in 1994, because that's really what brought in the GM corn, because it actually allowed GM maize in from the US, from Iowa, <laughs> into Mexico. It was dumped, very low prices um, in there. So Mexico being self-sufficient, obviously, in maize. By 2007, it was importing a third of it. Um, and when that was imported, it also led to a, led to a shift in US-style diets as well, a massive increase <coughs> in processed foods, because really, NAFTA essentially exported obesity, if you like, to Mexico, because the prepared foods that Mexico had to import were processed, they were high in sugar, salt and fat, you know, they were coaxed and encouraged to give up traditional tortillas and beans and have like pizza slices and fast food. So now, Mexico actually has the highest child obesity rate in the world, surpassing even the US. So what does all this mean? I suppose what I'm trying to show here, that what we eat is a consequence of how agriculture is organised into capitalism, where profit overrides all other concerns, and that model is being exported. It means really that no area of food production is out of bounds. Capitalism commodifies everything. Um, even organic farming that comes under the control of multinationals like Walmart ends up using highly intensive farming techniques of the kind, kind described. It doesn't mean it's sustainable necessarily. <coughs> and we have the absurdity of food crops being diverted to produce fuel. Like I say, biofuels might sound environmentally friendly, they're not. They use massive amounts of land and energy, land and water, sorry, to produce very small amounts of fuel. And actually, by diverting crops, into out of the food system as it were into this it causes massive price spikes this is what actually led to the big price uh, spikes of 2008 and actually biofuels are really a way of big business finding a market for this overproduction of grain we've talked about that's been produced in a completely unsustainable way in the first place so all of these things have changed our diet shaped and impacted on the environment and the problem is when we talk about climate change, these big businesses see this as an even more business uh, opportunity. In uh, Mozambique, Monsanto is pushing something called water efficient maize, the Africa scheme, as a way to open up the country to GM crops in case there was more um, droughts. Um, so we see this as an opportunity to get the GM crops into areas. And then when there's a problem of a lack of diversity in, in our diets, particularly in some of the developing countries where um, farmers stop producing a variety of crops and grains and vegetables and produce just one, their answer is to fortify the seeds with vitamins. So you have things like golden rice, which have vitamin A as part of it. So rather than addressing the agri wider agricultural problems, they'll stack GM seeds with lots of different traits um, to deal with you know, controlling pests and weeds, vitamins, resisting drought. And like you know, Mexican farmers were saying, I'll, I'll point out the books later, the problems are much more complex than this. They can't really just be solved by one seed in a gene. We have to look at a bigger picture here. But really, of course, this is a way of allowing these big companies to carry on business as normal and expand it and carry on creating the problems that they, you know, cause in the first place. So, really, I think the more you look at it to conclude, the clearer it seems that the food that is both unhealthy and destructive of the environment is not a consequence of consumer choice but a result of corporate interests backed up by governments and politicians. And really at heart is how it's organised into capitalism and this vast overproduction that we've talked about. 
And global markets favour this. They want bulk, uniform commodities that can be traded as raw materials. And then, really, if you look at a lot of the farm products now, it's breaking it all down into basic ingredients, the protein, carbs and oil, which are then reassembled back into these industrial products that are sold to us as foods, like soft drinks and processed foods, where the profits are made from. Wipes out diversity in food, actually. I saw a survey recently that said three quarters of the world's cur current calories originate from just 12 plants and five animal species. Mm. But to finish, I painted this big picture here, but actually there are massive battles over food, isn't there? Massive ones. Uh, the, the peasant movements over land and resisting the land grabs that are going on for more areas. The resistance to GMAs in Mexico has been ongoing. The issue of food sovereignty, which at the heart of it is the right to save seeds. Actually, well, I talked about the food, uh, the price the food price spike in 2008, it triggered the Arab Spring. Actually, I think some of the recent Reva revolution um, uprisings in Sudan, actually the price of bread was part of that at, at the beginning. And so for us, I would also say that the new movements and the battles we're involved in over climate change are part of this as well. And the solution is not individual dietary changes, but really a radical transformation of that food system and actually the entirety of that capitalism system itself. Um, I just want to talk a bit on veganism, if I can. Um, so there's three main reasons that people go vegan. Um, one for their health, which is fair enough. Um, one for animal welfare, again, fair enough. And the other is um, for the environment, which is the one that I have an issue with. Um, I'm vegan myself. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry. Is that, yeah. Sorry, it's um, a high-pitched noise. <laughs> I'm just shocked by that. Sorry. So, um, yeah, the, so um, the environmental vegans kind of tend to point the finger at each other. Um, which this kind of just leaves space if, um, you know, companies like British Petroleum, Shell, etc. to continue killing the planet and stuff like that because we're taking the point in the finger away from the um, real damages of our environment. Um, so vegans can't really be utopianists. We need to look at the bigger picture and the bigger picture is that 100 companies uh, contribute 71% um, of carbon emissions. and. Um, Environmental vegans have made a choice to go against the norm of capitalist society, which we have all made a choice to go against capitalist society just being in this room, so we can relate. Um, but the issue um, isn't vegans, um, their heart is in the right place, but their finger is pointing at the wrong position, is the point I'm trying to make. Uh, why? Well, I, don't, I, just, I'm gonna, I just want to have a chance to do anything. Do you want to put your hand up and come back? Yeah, I just wanted to, I wanted to get him to go on. Okay, okay. sorry, I'm not talking about veganism, I'm talking about I'm going to talk about the uh, the um, the imminent extinction of the honeybee as a plug for socialism. Amy discussed quite a lot uh, about the overproduction of food, and sorry, I know you've heard me bang on about bees before, Amy. Um, but, but under capitalism, there is is no guarantee that we're going to continue there. We're going to continue to be able to feed ourselves at all. Um, Fifty percent of of the honeybee, of honeybees, Apis mellifera, in Northern Ireland, are dead. They're extinct in China. In China, they have to climb up fruit trees and, and pollinate the fruit trees by hand. Imagine how expensive that is. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a number of reasons why honeybees are going extinct. One is the use of neonicotinoids, and Amy mentioned Roundup. Um, another, another big possibility is um, the, the, the practice of monoculture, that honeybees being a, a social animal just don't seem to like being raised in these big lorries where they're first, you know, cart for two weeks carted around to acres and acres of almond trees and then carted miles and miles away to the peach trees. They just don't seem to like this. But under capitalism, this problem is, is being dealt with um, it, it is regarded simply as a, an increased cost. You know, it's just, um, you know, the honeybee is hit because honeybees are, are dying out. It's raised the prices for farmers 25% uh, in America. So they've just jacked up prices by 25%. There's absolutely no um, incentive to actually deal with the problem. I think the whole the situation of agriculture just shows how short-sighted and irrational capitalism is. Um, and you mentioned the situation with, uh, in the 19th century, people were going out annexing small islands um, to try and get guano from seabirds. Um, this whole thing was so 
destructive that they're actually digging up so much guano from these islands that they destroyed the nests of the seabirds, mm -hmm. which also obviously prevented more seabirds from, from breeding and then that you, you reduce your, your, your stock of guano in the future. So there's, there's no long-term planning involved in it. Similar with the honeybees. If you kill off the honeybees, then how are those almond farmers going to pollinate their crops? Um, there are some people on the left who even say that this means that capitalism is going to reach some kind of crisis, but and then that will be the end of capitalism maybe in, in the short term future. But I think um, we probably, I would argue that actually capitalism puts its crises onto the working class and just you know makes them into costs for us, as, as the last speaker said. Um, I just want to briefly mention the issue of agricultural workers as well, because I think if we're going to change the whole system, then people who work in agriculture should be, they must, they must have to be a part of that. Um, and which isn't to say that we should, you know, as socialists go out um, to farms and try and self-socialist worker to them it would be quite you know logistically too difficult because they're just too widely spread but I do think something is happening among agricultural workers they're often extremely low paid and um, you see some of them speak at things like the alternative um, farming conference in Oxford they're talking about how can we change the system of agriculture how can we change what people eat um, how can we improve our own conditions as workers a lot of them are also migrant workers as well like if you you, you know, you get your, your peppers and things from from Fanet, Earth in Fanet. It's they employ huge numbers of people from from Eastern Europe and things. And you know, at the moment, UKIP are trying to, well, well in the past, UKIP were trying to kind of win votes there. Uh, but yeah, that, that's all I say about about workers in agriculture. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think it was a really, really good talk. I, I've got an interest because I'm a, a dietitian in the NHS and I'm kind of really, you know, fed up with hearing the blame culture mm. of the obesity epidemic in which people, again, are made to believe that it's their lack of willpower to refuse, you know, uh, the sorts of foods that Amy's talked about. You know, we're living in a world in which massive profit is made out of these kinds of foods which um, you know are advertised and are actually very very cheap so actually when you look at the obesity uh, 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 stuff uh, you know reports in the UK 20% of people have got a body mass index over 30 and yes of course it is killing it is killing people and we we absolutely don't want that but actually there's a direct relationship between obesity and poverty and that didn't actually used to be the case. Actually, reports say that in the past, you know, obesity was partially related. People got loads of money. It's tragic that we actually have to look back to the Second World War as some kind of golden age when people ate the right thing. They were on bloody rationing. You know, I mean, you know, surely we can actually, you know, it's all about, as they say, producing food for human need, looking at how we produce that food safely. And a couple of other points really quickly baby milks and baby foods these are other things that have actually tried to de-skill people's knowledge we don't learn about enough about how to cook food in school it's not seen as important so a lot of the time people people are exhausted as amy said in another me meeting and, and resort to ready meals and fast foods and are then blamed for it the government does nothing to curb the food industry the sugar tax just it's the only thing that came in and that just meant they slightly put a few more artificial sweeteners in soft drinks and uh, you know uh, finally um, you know there's an attack on free school meals which I, I, I think has actually been kind of slightly overlooked because it's actually connected to the to the rollout of universal credit um, they're reassessing who is responsible who gets a free school meal and actually endorse it alone where I'm from it's going to be some it's going to be something like a quarter of a million less children entitled to free school meals and the child poverty action group is and then but they're not doing it till after the next election people need to be very wise to this because free schools meals is also connected to funding in education so you know there's a lot going on but I, I do feel optimistic that people are becoming more aware because of you know extinction rebellion and all the stuff so thank you okay um well i'm probably quite a rarity in the Marxism, and that I'm actually a livestock farmer, and that I'm a, I'm a sheep farmer in the Peter Street. And I say that in a sort of slightly jesty way, but I am, I've got a DEFRA license to keep sheep. But we basically run a community sporting agriculture scheme as a workers' co op. And I think there's lots of interesting things going on within farming in Britain. Someone mentioned it before about alternative farming, and there is, a, there is lots of pockets of alternative ways of farming around CSA, community sports agriculture, care farms, and these people who are involved in these projects 
are beginning to question the ideas. They are, you know, anti anti um, Monsanto, anti GM, and they're beginning to question even, you know, how livestock farming is done and looking at more alternative, small scale ways of, of doing that. And people are quite. You know, I I sell I sell uh, meat, and people are questioning me. Well, why are your why are your pork chops? I wanted ones that were all the same size. They're all a bit odd. I wanted eight pork chops. I said, well. On the animal, the different sizes, and so we just, we just slaughtered one pig, and you know, and people are questioning because they don't know anything about their food. So I'm just saying that really things are happening in the countryside around CSA, and it is someone said, oh, we don't need to go to farms and sell social worker, but I think there are certain types of farming projects that are happening now that you do need to go to, and that people are questioning those ideas and don't write off people in the countryside of people who are you know Tory farmers and there are a lot of very very low paid farm workers who are not in our workers co-op but are just farm workers who you know are terribly paid and are interested in, in things like our workers co-op and saying well, to their farms like small livestock farms why can't we be a workers co-op so I think don't write it off not all farmers are you know Tories. Although we do still have not Tory farmers, I'm not eating. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just have to say I'm not Tory farmers. Thanks. Uh, yeah, just to reinforce the point that Amy made right at the beginning about the individual choice. I live in Scotland, and Scotland is a fuss of jokes about the appalling diet, etc., etc. It's a class-based issue. It's about the history of the industrial uh, uh, central belt and all that sort of stuff. That's where it comes from. And I'm, I had a, there was a really interesting discussion around the Edinburgh Trades Council, would you believe, uh, the other day, because a number of teachers there, and they're talking about that they're, they're really frightened about the summer holidays, because during the summer holidays, there are no free school meals. And the food banks are saying, we will not have enough food to be able to feed people over the summer because of, because of that. And so the whole discussion about what do you do about it? And somebody said, what we need to do is we all need to make sure that we uh, do collections of food, etc., etc., etc. And then somebody else said, no, actually, what we need to do is talk about, uh, the, look at the, what are the campaigning groups, what are we doing there, what are we doing about the way that food is produced, you know, get Extinction Rebellion, etc., etc. So there's a debate to be had. Uh, between the individual solution and the, you know, and the, the class and uh, collective solution as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just saying that um, in 1963, Rachel Castle wrote, wrote a very important book called Silent Spring uh, that talked about the uh, environmental devastation caused by the agrochemical industry, and it seems that nothing has changed since then. If anything, things things have got worse. Um, uh, you know, on, on, on the subject of, uh, you, you know, the use and dependency of these chemicals has just increased, and that's because of, you know, capitalism not listening to, to the scientific evidence. Uh, on, on the question of um, vegetarianism, it was, oh, and veganism, it was one of the things that XR refused to, to make a demand, and they were, and they came under a lot of pressure from vegan groups who were furious that one of their demands, they got three demands, but didn't mention veganism at all and I think they were quite right to hold out on that because it doesn't address certain issues for instance in the UK between 30 and 40 percent of the food consumed here is wasted either is burnt or ends up in landfill why is that it doesn't explain that I'll give you one example of um, you know um, pig's will I, I remember when I used to go to school we used to empty uh, food into a waste bucket and it would be p p picked up by the pig swill man and it would be turned into pig feed. Now to me that's a very sensible use of food waste, turning it into pork. And that practice was banned in 2002 because of foot and mouth disease, because a big farmer wasn't using the safe practices. And so it was banned throughout Europe. The consequence of that is that the, the Europe, EU, started importing soya from South America, very wasteful, very destructive, and expensive way of raising pork. And, and this is the, the consequence of that. And, and the, um, the food lobby uh, said, no, we don't want to, you to vaccinate the, the pigs because then we can't export them. So we wanted to, you to slaughter six and a half million pigs uh, and have institute this system. Whereas what they should have done was, was, was say, no, we, we want to reduce food waste. Uh, and that is not addressed by, by going vegetarian. Okay, thanks. Actually, I've been an environmental activist for 34 years. So, <laughs> and it was a long time ago that I realised the interconnection between environmental and 
environmental issues and um, capitalism because they are so closely linked. You know, and I, I bought um, a book from here a few years ago, calling, and it was called um, Capitalism Versus Planet Earth. And I mean, it said it all, and it said everything that has been said in this room, from bees to pig swill. It is all about, and Monosoto, and um, glycoside, and nicotinamides, and bees. It's all down to capitalism, and capitalism is destroying itself. It's imploding, because um, if we, I don't know if it's going to happen soon enough to save the planet, that's the only problem. Um, but it's, um, you cannot be an environmentalist without being anti-capitalism. You cannot be an environmentalist. The two things go together. And, um, you know, I agree. By the way, I'm not vegan, but I do agree with the vegan argument for being an, envir uh, for an environmental. And I do not eat a lot of meat because of that. Thank you very much. I'm going to yeah. go to the woman in the middle there and then... Hi, yes, thanks very much, Amy. Uh, that, that was brilliant, and, um, but it was also quite scary. And um, I do amaze myself that I can go around not knowing a lot of the stuff you told us. I think it's, I mean, it makes me f so furious what they're allowed to sell us. Um, I've worked in the NHS since the 80s. I'm a nurse on a cancer ward. Um, and, uh, I mean, I terrorise the poor catering staff. It's not their fault. I don't know if any other people don't seem to notice, but the, the when the trolley goes round, there is nothing, nothing nutritious on that trolley by the time it gets fed to a patient. But worse than that, one of the main side effects that patients suffer from, probably all out the NHS, is constipation. Any nurse worth her salt should be obsessed with bowels as I am. And so I look at the breakfast trolley and I'm like, kiwi fruit. Recently, they've got a bottle of Robinson's Barley orange squash. I mean, Jesus, that's called orange juice. It's a five star. I'll name the trust, I'll name and shame it. UCH Trust, five stars, use a privatised company, and I terrorise the catering manager, but I do feel a little bit in a minority, so I just wanted to share that. And I'm constantly um, horrified. I mean, my dream job, to be honest, would be to prepare food for patients and take my time, and I'd want to be paid extremely well for it, and that's not going to happen this side of the revolution, I don't think. The other thing, though, I wanted to just touch on was, um, I mean, that, that's really the main point, and um, other people have made it. The people who I watch, I watch nurses, my colleagues, getting, um, you know, becoming obese. Partly our shift work, partly, but also people I think of particularly who are fantastic cooks, but they work ridiculous hours. Filipino nurses, who one of them, and her friends keep saying, you've got to go on a diet, because they're worried about her, not because they're being moralistic. They are, actually, she lives on brioche bread, because it's what she can afford, because she sends half her wages home to the Philippines. So all those things you talk about, it's not, and she's extremely intelligent. She's not on her own, but it's an example. The very last thing I wanted to say is, one, um, I didn't think you were going to turn me into a vegan, and I'm probably not going to leave her and be one, but I'm grateful for the education. I wanted to ask what you think of these, it, well, I mean, I think they're trendy, but I'd also like to quite go to one of them, these restaurants springing up that feed people only on waste products, and whether, um, you know, because I do think there's nothing wrong with, well, I don't know, a little bit of lifestyle politics if you end up with more green on your plate, and that's all I'll say. <laughs> Um, I want to thank uh, Amy for, for the talk because uh, I think like other people it's very educational uh, it is also very frightening about what uh, I think all the climate change related meetings will be a similar feel about it and I, I, I like it I mean I read about the Punjab and it was a real I mean you know if you've been a socialist around for a while you, you're used to reading horror stories that was just gobsmacking to me and the way in which these things are interconnected. We are really brought up to believe that things are compartmentalised. You understand suicide as something about mental health, then you, you look at drug addiction as something separate, or you look at climate change and so on and so forth and the drive for profit. The way in which uh, that film, I, I, you know, I will want to go and see that film, I think talks about how these things are interconnected is, is very, 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 very powerful indeed. And I think about India the last month. That report about the Punjab, you think about the heat wave in North uh, India, you know, in somewhere like New Delhi of 48 degrees centigrade, and if you're poor, and let's be honest, that's millions of people, you, you are not in a flat or a house with air conditioning, or that you live in Chennai and the water's running out and you can't buy 
water because the water prices are going up. There are people making money in Chennai, right? The rich are making money and people are, you know, are in desperate situations. Or you look, then look at Mumbai and this mass flooding. This is just on one, I mean, it's a big, you know, it's a big country, a huge level of devastation. And I think the other thing which obviously preoccupies us, and rightly so, is the connection between, you know, collapse in places of agriculture and the need for uh, people to move and migration. I think I was reading about Honduras and so on and so forth. That now climate change will become the major factor in, in the question of, uh, of migration. And the last point is, I, I think, I think in XR, and I'm involved in Bristol, I think there's a, a real thirst for radical understanding about what's taking place in the world. And I think, you know, those of us on the revolutionary left have got a very big job to do. But I think meetings like this and the stuff we produce, I think there's a real, real uh, uh, testament to, to the vitality of Marxist ideas. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that was a really interesting uh, detailed description about the destructive treadmill of, uh, of capitalist in intensive agriculture. And actually, while you were talking, it reminded me of a, this is quite an anecdotal thing. I had my brother-in-law stay with me last week, and he's over from Florida. And he usually jogs along the, uh, the beach in Florida. And uh, uh, that's impossible at the moment where he lives, because the, uh, the nitrates which are running off into the ocean there are creating massive blooms. And as the waves come, come in, um, you get this sort of toxic gas which comes, comes in onto the beach. And so some of the joggers have actually collapsed from the, from the gas produced by, produced by that. It is scary, but it's absolutely critical what's happening. Um, I agree also with what John was saying about Rachel Carson. It is an amazing book, and it was very, uh, you know, she was alluding to, these, uh, to this destructive uh, uh, application of wartime chemicals back in, the, back, in, back in the 50s when our own farm was, effect, was, 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 effect, was affected. And it was actually interesting because uh, um, after the um, declaration of uh, a climate catastrophe was called, called um, the only MP that came out was Cor Corbyn to Parliament Fields after Extinction Rebellion had actually been, you know, occupied the five areas. And he referred to that book, Silent, Str Silent, Silent, Silent Spring. Um, and of course, yeah, the, the whole ugly process still still continues. But as other people have said, you know, the, uh, the, the contributor behind me who works in livestock, there are many fantastic examples within capitalism of alternative uh, food production techniques that I think we can we can apply, but could only apply within a sort of socialist system, not a sort of collectivized system that we saw in Stalinist Russia. But you know. Um, I, I was I was cycling through Fran France uh, fairly recently, and as you go down through Bordeaux, you see the tractors with wings on both sides, and they're spraying the they're spraying the vineyards. When you have your bottle of bottle of wine, if it isn't organic, those you know the, the, the grapes that are made have been covered in chemicals. And same with those massive uh, 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 corn corn fields. Um, but also, when I got to the end of my cycle ride, I went to a film. Um, and there were some activists there from an organisation called Farms for the Future, and they were basically battling against the, the, the banks and the chemical companies to get permaculture established. And I think just, just as we have technical solutions to addressing climate change in, in, terms of our, in terms of renewables based on nature, solar, wind, tidal, we have a model within agriculture or permaculture where we can use the, the logic of, eco, of ecosystems, plants fixing nitrates into soil to, uh, to combat uh, soil sterility and so on. Ingenious methods where we learn from nature um, can be put into place, but obviously only within a different system. And I would like to ask Amy a little bit about agriculture in, a, in that different system that we are fighting for now. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, that's quite interesting because actually I wanted to talk about the alternative to agriculture because actually I think most of these people in this room, if someone came up to them and said, how would you organise a factory under socialism? You go, well, actually, collective ownership, you know, you democratically decide. If you said to you, how do you organise food production? How do you organise a farm? I think people have a lot more difficulty understanding and explaining that question. And I, I, the first thing I think we have to say is actually the people who know the most about it, the people who would be the people who could tell the rest of the world 
how to farm sustainably and healthily and, and the rest of it are the people who already do it. And, and, that, and that's true whether they work on a big farm in Britain, whether they work in a sheep farm in the Peak District, or whether they work uh, in, uh, in, in a farm in Sub-Saharan Africa. And, and, and I think that the first thing we have to say, apart from the fact that industrial agriculture is tremendously destructive and appallingly for people's health and terrible for, for people who work on the, uh, on, on the land, is that actually if we want to look to a future sustainable world, the starting point has to be some of the practices that already happen. And first thing I, I want to be clear though, is I do not think that means that the day after the revolution, what we want to do is replicate a, a vision of a, pe a peasantry around the world. And partly because actually being a peasant under capitalism is terrible. Um, there's about uh, around about 400,000 peasants feed a billion people in the world today, slightly over a billion people, and they do so with no tractors, no fertilizer. They do it with manual tools, mm -hmm. like their grandparents did, and like their great grandparents did, and like feudal peasants did in the 17th and 16th century. Uh, I don't want that to be the future for food agriculture. Actually, however, what they do have is a whole strategy for things like multi-crop use, sharing of food, sharing of equipment, collective organisation, which which allows a vision of agriculture that would be opened up with if you take away the profit motive from the uh, from the bigger the bigger system. And actually, our tradition, the SWP's tradition, has a, a lot of writing on this stuff. People may forget or not know that Tony Cliff, back in the 60s, wrote a big book on uh, a little pamphlet on the uh, uh, collectivisation of agriculture under socialism, which took up some of the debates and arguments and and said, look, this is the way it could be done. The other thing I have, think we have to say is to look what happens when people are empowered and when they do engage in struggle. And actually, often people in the countryside are at the forefront of those big struggles. There's a wonderful book on the top table there, uh, Amy. I know used in her talk, uh, Eating Tomorrow, which actually talks about how peasants have both got the sustainable vision at the heart of their agriculture, but also the people fighting back for a sustainable food. And we have to think, how can the working class in urban areas link up and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and fight for, for together for people, because that's the future. Okay, well look, that was a great discussion, and as ever at these meetings, just learn so much as well from people. But look, I'll just touch on a few things. The question of veganism um, is interesting, isn't it? Because I think that a lot of people have taken it up as a response to being worried about the climate. It, and that's, you know, a, a good thing that people want to do something. And it seems that's something under your control to do. The problem is actually capitalism co-ops everything to make money from. And actually, you look at some of the foods that are being produced that are vegan. They are in no way sustainable. I mean, you might have seen from in London that picture of the veggie patty from Sub. It was everywhere advertised. Don't tell me that was not processed yeah. with all these base, agreement, base ingredients like maize or soya or uh, wheat at the heart of it. They're, they can be just as processed just because they're vegan. And look, there are lots of reasons why you might choose not to eat meat under capitalism, partly because of how it's produced under capitalism. But I don't think saving the environment <laughs> is a reason. I don't think not eating meat is going to help the environment in that way. And actually, look at some of the things that I talked about how the unsustainable farming practices end up being exported into all different types of foods. You look at some of the things that are brought up, like, I mean, I think it's pronounced quinoa. I like to call it quinoa. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, actually, this is an ancient Andean staple. Now, it's been discovered, hasn't it? You know, you can charge a very high price for it um, now in the West. But actually, it meant that for the people that make it, the price trebled. They've had to start looking to eating cheap imported bread and pastas. And all these wow. traditional quinoa farmers pushed out of the market. The crop has moved from the terrace hillsides. It was part of quite a complex cropping and animal husbandry rotation system. Gone down to the bottom land pastures where it's now a monocrop, really, in these large mechanised fields. Mm -hmm. these, the fragile grazing areas that were on had had llama on for millennia. You know, disappearing under this quinoa boom. There's erosion, dust storms, hardship for traditional communities. It's the same process. Or you could look at avocado. It's Kenya's sixth biggest um, export, um, the world's sixth biggest exporter is Kenya. They had to ban their exports because their own food supply was at risk. Uh, Mexico, the actual drive for it, um, actually another place where apparently avocado originated again in Mexico, um, it supplies about 48% of the world's avocados. Wow. But it's, it's talked about importing them and they've actually driven more illegal deforestation. Mm -hmm. Um, you think about the nut industry, you know, part of that planetary diet I was saying about was eating more nuts, and you think that's going to be good. The almond industry relies massively on intensive farms in Central Valley in California. 80% of the world's almonds are grown there. And actually, it's a semi-desert. There's 60 million almond trees. That means so much water, you know, that brought in. So you just feel like you could go on. All these things that 
in themselves you think are healthy, they're pushed to you, you know, that you can help do this, but actually they are just found, you know, produced in the same way as part of that bigger agricultural system. And this is typical of capitalism though, isn't it? They create a problem, then they blame us for it, don't they? And we have to try and find the solution. And I just found this really interesting quote, because we're saying really if you want to talk about climate change and saving the planet, I have to direct it at those fossil fuel corporations and companies at the heart of the system. Recently, the chief executive of Shell, he said, well, you know, people should eat seasonally and recycle more. Um, he lambasted consumers who choose to eat strawberries in winter. By the way, he you know, relies on his oil to transport them. But, you know, they blame us. It's very convenient to do that for them. And this is why I think it is right that actually organisations like Extinction Rebellion have actually said, well, we're not going to... Uh, individualise this. We're going to look at the systemic nature of the problem and highlight that and look to more collective actions to challenge it. And you see it's quite interesting because I think then taking on the food question, we've brought up so much stuff I can't come back on, but you know you can just imagine a different food way of producing food and how we eat it and how it's served and using the NHS like Janet was talking about. You know, the, the, it's amazing. How, how could we get there though? And I think we have the opportunity you see at the climate strike on the 20th of September. Because this is the idea that actually on that day, workers join students on the streets and walk out of work for climate. That's about collective action. Just think, I mean, we've talked about some of the agricultural workers, and Martin came back on some of the questions around peasantry, so that's good because I don't have got time to. But actually, think of all the workers in the food industry. Think about them in Britain. Think about the people in those processing food companies. You know, most places aren't really farms as such, there are you know, some are very mechanised centres, they fly in produce, they add value, process it in some way, it goes out again. Or you think about the just-in-time distribution systems of the supermarkets. There's a massive food industry where workers are very well placed to actually hit those companies that make money for if they walk out on strike. And actually Bafawu, which is the bakers union, but actually organises a lot of food production workers, has actually said we support the climate strike. And I think our job is to think, how do we make that date a reality so we start to collectively point the finger upwards, actually get walkouts in workplaces, and actually put some solutions there. That was start, that's the start of it, isn't it? It's shown where our power lies, particularly to hit these profits of these big companies, when it can look so scary and they look so powerful. How do we start hitting them? But actually, for us as socialists, we do have to think about a complete transformation. And the real question is, isn't it, is about ownership. It's about, actually, is there a social uh, problem here where this land is being taken and owned by other people who then, you know, these big corporations, the Monsantos, the Cargills, all these ones who want to reap profit out of it and don't care of the impact on us. And that ultimately is about how do we rest that back and have real control over our food and how it's used and how it's grown and what we make and have some real seed making. So that means talking about much bigger change actually it talks about revolutionary change it talks about socialist ideas that people have brought out here and the capacity to reshape our world in a completely different way but it starts not just waiting for a revolution but us taking the actions now to be part of those mass movements that are beginning to challenge those big companies at the top of the system to make real actually the notion system change not climate change